All right, thanks, Titus. All right, uh, good morning to all of you. Could you turn your Bibles to the Gospel of John? John chapter 17, verse 13. John chapter 17, verse 13. Uh, this morning we're going to uh, have a teach on the second installment on the, on the subject of sanctification. But uh, before we uh, begin a new book, we're going to be doing 2 John in a couple of weeks, which is only one chapter. And, uh, but but between, those two, uh, between that book and the book of Philemon, which we just completed a couple of weeks ago, I decided to do a three-week study on the subject of sanctification. And last week we noted positional sanctification, that at the moment of your conversion, when you had trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, uh, the Holy Spirit identified you with Jesus Christ in His crucifixion, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. So we're going to see how that applies, and how, uh, and we're going to talk about experiential sanctification, experiencing that which is true of us positionally. So uh, we'll, uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, and next week we'll do uh, perfective sanctification, or ultimate sanctification, and that's uh, going to be talking about when we get a resurrection body, when we're perfected in a resurrection body. So that'll be next week, and then following that we'll do Second John and uh, begin a study of that. So uh, if you could also, if you could turn not only into to the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 13, in your Bibles, but also in your songbooks, if you could turn to page 107, we're going to do Majesty. We haven't done that in a while. So page 107 in your songbooks, we're going to do Majesty. And uh, just a few announce- announcements. Our class schedule is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8. We're doing the book of Daniel during the week. Um, we're in, currently uh, in the middle of Daniel chapter 7, and then we're going to, uh, our prayer meeting is on Thursday evenings, uh, at corporate prayer meeting at the end of class. And also, uh, um, our website is www.wenstrom.org, and also, uh, I don't know if you know it, we have an internet radio station in, uh, under a, com- a program called Shoutcast, so uh, people can live to listen to this class live now on internet radio, it's really good. And uh, so I've been putting that stuff out on uh, Facebook, on our Facebook, my Facebook page, so, which I basically, my Facebook page is basically for the ministry. <laughs> I, never, I never put any personal things out. I'm going to the bathroom, you know, like some people is like, I don't need to know that, too much information. So anyways, um, yeah, so uh, that, uh, keep that in prayer. And, uh, and also I, uh, uh, we had uh, our, our hits on our website, I, th- I mentioned from time to time, um, we used to average, you know, about a year ago, you know, between two and 300 hits a day. Sometimes you get a 400 hit day or, you know, but that was really good. But now we get easily in the thousands every day for, this has been going on for the last couple of months. So there's a increase, uh, in, uh, in people, um, hitting our website. I, I understand it. There's some of them obviously like places like Google and Bing, but a lot of these are not. Uh, most of these are people hitting the site. So uh, that's that's good to he- that's good to know. So just keep these people in prayer, and then we'll hear from some of them if, if uh, God moves them to uh, communicate with us. And uh, what else do we need to say? Um, we uh, we had to take our Sunday morning uh, offering at the end of class here today. All right, let's take a moment of silent prayer. Let's prepare ourselves to hear what the Holy Spirit's going to say to us through the teaching of the Word of God. Uh, let's prepare ourselves to worship God. Remember, Jesus said to the woman at the well in John four. Uh, that we're to worship the Father in spirit and truth. So in order for that to take place, the first, uh, first the piece of truth that we need to apply at this particular time, if we need to, is applying 1 John 1, 9, which states, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins with the result that He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. And uh, once you've done that, you've restored the filling of the Spirit and your fellowship with God. Um, and we maintain that fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says through the teaching of the Word of God. Let me give you an example about that. Um, uh, let's say you're, you, you're anxious about there's certain things going on in your life financially, like we all have, and so the first bit of thing you could do, the, what the sin nature does and what the devil would want you to do is to get worried about these things. So the choice you have to make is, is you could be get worried about it and you know, have a heart attack and what else, make your life even worse. I know people like that. They, they make it, they're, so, they're such worry warts and they're Christians and they have given themselves heart attacks. They're so stressed out. You can do two things. Yeah, you can say, all right, uh, your word says, Lord, uh, in, in you know, Philippians 4, 6, not to be worried about anything, but to pray instead. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. So um, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you, Father. Well, when you do that, 
um, that's bringing your thoughts and obedience to the Spirit because that's what the Holy Spirit is saying through the teaching of the Word of God and how to handle that problem that you have and, uh, and, how, uh, and how I'm supposed to handle it as well. So this is extremely important. And uh, so uh, now's the time to uh, make sure that we're in fellowship with the, the Holy Spirit and thus in fellowship with the Father and the Son so that we can worship the Lord and uh, we can also learn what God has to say to us. Uh, when we come to Bible class, I hope... You're not looking at this as, uh, you know, we're going to come to hear Bill teach like Bill's an entertainer or something. Bill's not an entertainer if you haven't figured that out. Um, I'm here to just tell you what God says to me in the Word, and I'm just trying to communicate it to you people, uh, the body of Christ, because uh, uh, this is what God is, this is my calling, this is what God has called me to do, and uh, I want to share, God wants me to share with all of you what He has said to me in the Scriptures, so... And uh, so this is a time we're going to listen to God, uh, what he has to say. So if you can, try to block out the fact that it's me up here speaking. Um, you might, some, I know some people say, oh, you know, I can't listen to another man. Well, you might as well throw the Bible out because God used men to communicate his will to men. So I just think it's, uh, it's very important that we remember, remind ourselves of that. And sometimes we can get too worked up about the personality and, you know, we get into iconoclastic arrogance where we make so much of the pastor, and we got a lot of that going on. You know, the personality cult. This is not about me. I'm just a servant. Anybody else is a pastor. You're supposed to be just a servant of the Lord. And so, uh, yeah, you're supposed to honor your pastor and you show respect from based upon who God is. U- God's using him to help you, and he's a pers- he's in a position of authority to communicate the word of God. But let's not make too much out of the pastor and make, uh, we have too much going on of the personality cult, too much thing about the celebrity thing that's in Christianity today. Uh, you know, that's not what it's all about. Jesus Christ is the true celebrity, the only celebrity. And the day that I decide I'm going to make myself the celebrity is the day I want him to kill me. <laughs> I don't want to be here for, to, 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 uh, to tell people about me because I'm pretty boring. You don't want to talk about me. You want to talk about the Lord. You want to, you want to know about him. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've given us another day here on this earth. Many times we think we, we take for granted that we've been given another day to live and you, know, you have not guaranteed us years or decades, but uh, another day. And we just pray that the hours that we are, are awake and conscious uh, in this world, that we would use it to bring glory to you, that we would learn today about your will, about your character and nature, what you've done for us through your Son and the Spirit. Help us in this subject of sanctification. We just pray that it would be a great blessing to the body of Christ, that the body of Christ would receive it with a humble and sincere heart, that they would consider the passages and principles here this morning in your word pertaining to this subject so that we might experience fellowship with you, your holiness in our lives, and also become more like your Son, Jesus Christ, which is your plan for our lives. And we look forward to the day that will be in resurrection bodies, and we pray, Father, that you would help us to, uh, to order our priorities in such a fashion that we do not commit idolatry, that we put you first in everything, and that, uh, we, so that we might receive a, f- a full reward at the Bema Seat evaluation of the church. Uh, Father, we just, uh, we just uh, pray for myself this morning that you would empower me to deliver to your people your full counsel. We pray that you would... Uh, Use me as your instrument to communicate your full counsel to your people. Help me to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction as well as the audience. Uh, We also, Father, we pray that you would uh, give uh, wisdom with Titus with the sound and the recordings. And we just thank you for the technology that you've given us. We thank you for Titus' service. We thank you for Titus and Jody's uh, sacrifice, opening up their home to us and demonstrating 
your love to the body of Christ and uh, honoring you through your, uh, taking care of the body of Christ. We thank you for everyone that is here in the Thompson household. And uh, we just pray, uh, thank you for them, but also our brothers and sisters in Christ that are uh, on listening, uh, might be viewing this class through the website or internet radio, listening in, or the or Pal Talk. We just pray that they would receive, all of them, would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment, that they would take this information and apply it in their lives and their walk with you. And uh, Father, we also pray for the song service, that it would uh, be... Uh, uh, done in the, the power of the Spirit and out of love and appreciation for you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. So, Father, we just uh, pray for these people and things in our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, could you all, re- ri- <laughs> could you all rise, please? <laughs> Page 107 in your songbooks. I'm going to do Your Majesty. Majesty, worship his majesty unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Oh, majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raised. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. O oh, Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. O oh, Majesty, Kingdom authority, flow from His throne unto His own, His anthem raise. Flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem rest. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, as I noted, uh, in our announcements uh, today, we're going to continue our study, uh, three-part study on the doctrine of sanctification. We're going to do that by noting experiential sanctification. Last week, we noted positional sanctification, which, quick by way of review, uh, and I would definitely recommend everybody who did not get that to go listen in or go download the document on sanctification in our written library. Very important subject because we saw last evening, uh, or last Sunday, we saw that uh, positional sanctification is basically what God, how God views you, namely crucified with Christ, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. And it also is what he's done for you. 
and it's, it sets up the potential for us to experience sanctification in time, but it also, what he did for us at the moment of our conversion is it gives us the guarantee that he's going to perfect us, that he's going to give us a resurrection body and we'll be minus these sin natures. So we saw with positional sanctification, at the moment you trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit, it's called the baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit identified with you, identified you with Jesus Christ in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session. What do I mean by identified? <clears throat> well, it means is that when Christ died, God considers you and I to have died with Christ. When he was uh, buried, we too. When he was crucified, we were as well. Uh, when he was raised and seated at the right hand of the Father, we were as well. So uh, when it says uh, we were crucified with Christ, we were buried and died with Christ, and that's called retroactive positional truth, meaning it was done in the past when Christ died on the cross and uh, we were identified with him, but then it has results. It has, it has results that go on forever. Then, current positional truth is the fact that we were raised and seated with Christ. And uh, we, there's a lot of passages, we, uh, we'll note some of them again today, like uh, in, in relation to uh, experiential sanctification. Romans 6 is a big one. Uh, we're going to talk about... Uh, with, uh, we saw with Ephesians last week. If you notice with Paul, uh, especially in Ephesians, Paul, Ephesians and Colossians, like in the first three chapters of Ephesians, he tell, and also the first, the first uh, eight chapters of Romans, he tells you what God has done for you and I at a moment of our conversion, and then he gives it a practical application. So like in the first three chapters, he talks about our position in Christ. The last three chapters of Ephesians are about making the application of that position in Christ. Same thing with Romans. The first eight chapters talk about what God has made, who God made you to be, what he did for you through the Spirit and his Son, Jesus Christ, at the moment of our conversion, when we had trusted in Jesus as Savior. Then we saw chapters 12 through 16 is the application of these, of these things, of our position in Christ. So <clears throat> what it, this is great about, uh, great to know, is that spiritual, like for instance, self-esteem issues that we all seem to have, is that we get our, derive our self-esteem from our position in Christ. We're defined by God's love for us. We're defined not by the things that we own or the people or, or the relationships that we possess. We're not defined by the fact that we have a job or we a work or a particular place or the amount of money that we have or the home that we have or the talents that we might have. We are defined by our union and identification with Jesus Christ. So God looks at you as he looks at you uh, he looks at you uh, you and me, as he looks at his son, not as the second member of the Trinity, but in relation to all those events that Christ did on our behalf, die, uh, being crucified for us, be, dying for us, and also raising, being raised from the dead for us and seated at the right hand of the Father. Remember, when we came into this world, we, came, we were born into sin. We were identified with Adam. We were condemned in our sins and transgressions. We received the imputation of Adam's sin at the moment of our physical birth, so we were condemned. But God did something about what Adam did. Uh, what Adam did is he plunged his progeny, you and I, the human race, into sin and under the tyranny of sin and under the tyranny of Satan. Jesus Christ, the last Adam, he's called by Paul in 1 Corinthians, he, he basically negated what Adam did and gave us much more than what Adam ever lost for us. So, uh, you were, so if you want to explain it, an analogy here, take two circles. One circle, you were in Adam. Everybody in the human race is there. The minute you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit took you and I by the scruff of our spiritual necks and he put us in Christ. So as we saw last week, if you look in Paul's writings, in Christ, in him, in John 13 through 17, Jesus' uproom discourse, when he talks about the church age in, for the first time in, in great detail, in him, in me, the vine and the branches metaphor, Every branch that's in me, he, that's talking about your position in Christ, your union with Christ. And, the, and there's other analogies that describe this union identification with Christ, this positional sanctification, your position in Christ. We're, uh, we're said to be the, uh, the body. Jesus Christ is the head. So it's talking about the intimacy that's between Christ and, and, and the church, just as there's intimacy, we're intimately, the head's intimately connected to the rest of the parts of our body. Same thing with, he's called the, uh, the, uh, the bridegroom. We're called the bride of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5. And so that's trying to convey to us we're united to Christ, that we're in union with him. And God need, wants us to know that. He wants us, the devil's going to try to tell you 
all the things that you, how all the things trying to run you down and feel bad about yourself, but you died with Christ. The law can't condemn you. Sin, he can't condemn you because of the sin nature because you died with Christ on the cross and were buried with him. So how could God condemn us if we've died with Christ? He can't. The law can't condemn us either as we saw in Romans 7. So, and when we're raised and seated with Christ, how can God condemn us? He loves us with the same love that he loves his son, Jesus Christ. So he had to do this to his son, Jesus Christ, because of the position we were in in Adam. So we're in Christ. Now, this is what God do has done for us and what he has uh, provided for us. And this is how he views us. But we don't always experience, do we, that which is true of us positionally. Why is that? Well, we still have a sin nature. We still live in the devil's world. And we're in a fight. We're in a war. Paul talks about this war with a sin nature in Romans 7. Uh, we have a war with the kingdom of darkness, our enemy on the outside, and the devil's world system that we live in, in the midst of pagan idolatry. That's all from the devil's world. Those are our three great enemies. The cosmic system is Satan, Satan, and the indwelling sin nature. So we're in a conflict, we're in a battle, and, we have to, and the battle is the Lord's, and we have to walk by faith in what the Word of God says about us, and not by sight. What the world or our circumstances say, or our family members might say, it's all about what God has to say about us. And He has, a, and the whole point of Him placing us in union with Christ, one of, the, one of the points, is He wants us to do His will. He wants us to grow up to be like Jesus Christ. Now, if that couldn't happen unless He identified us with Christ in His crucifixion, His death, His burial, His resurrection, and session. He, 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 we couldn't do that will. If he didn't give us, he didn't indwell us along with his spirit and his son. He couldn't do, we couldn't execute his will if, we didn't, if he didn't unite us with Jesus Christ through the baptism of the spirit. So the foundation for the spiritual life is all wrapped up in our union with Christ. And that's related to positional sanctification. So this morning, we're going to know the experiential aspect of sanctification. So what is experiential sanctification? It's the function of our, uh, our, the church age believers, spiritual life in time. And it's accomplished through obedience. Obedience to the Father's will. Where do you find the Father's will? It's revealed by the Spirit through the communication of the Word of God. And this is taught in many places, such as in John chapter 17. And uh, what we see here is Jesus said, Father, in his great upper room discourse, sanctify them by, the, by truth. So truth is how we experience our sanctification. Truth in particular, the truths related to our union and identification with Jesus Christ. So John 17, 13 says, and this is the Lord talking, this is his great prayer to the Father, his great high, great high, uh, great high priestly prayer to the Father prior to being arrested and being betrayed by Judas. But now... I come to you, and you speaking of the Father, I speaking of Jesus, and these things, the things he spoke about in chapters 13 through 16 of the Gospel of John, I speak in the world so that they, believers, his disciples, may have my joy made full in themselves, meaning may it be, so that it will become a reality. God wants us to have his joy. Verse 14, and if you don't, it's because, it could be one of several things. One, you're, you're living in sin, and you could do that by not trusting in God. You could be worrying about things. That worry, anxiety, and fear can, is going to destroy that joy. The Spirit, God's Word says, this is, I will take care of you. I'm there for you. You're my child. You're my responsibility. You just worry about seeking my kingdom and, doing, and uh, experiencing my righteousness, and I'll add, take care of the logistics of life. I don't want to, I want to see you having joy in your life. So this is a battle we all have to face. So he's saying these things to them because he wants his joy to be in, in his disciples. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. The world hates us as well because they are not of the world and even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now look what he says. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify, sanctification means that you're set apart to serve God exclusively. He's saying here, the Lord is, 
that it's accomplished by the truth. By the truth. Sanctify them in the truth. You could say by the truth. Your word is truth. Truth is reality. The reality is you're not dead in your sins and transgressions and neither am I as a believer. We're, the devil can't, doesn't have us. He doesn't own us. Uh, even sin really doesn't. The reality of the situation is you're God's child. The reality of the situation is he loves you. You're the apple of his eye. He looks at you as he looks at his son. The law, his law can't condemn you. You died to the law through the death of Christ. You, you, your sin can't condemn you. God can't condemn you because of your sin because you died with Christ. So God says, I have raised you and seated you with Christ. I look at you in a place of victory with my son. And I want you to see, that's the reality. Faith, the circumstances say, that's not the reality. I, I, am, I, I, I am, have so many things going in my life that I'm not happy with. I don't like the circumstances I'm in or whatever it is. The reality is, you're God's child. You have a relationship with him. And the reality of the situation is, this is not going to last forever. Uh, this is going to come to this uh, end. This world's going to be uh, taken over by God himself. He's going to put it, establish his millennial reign, his son's millennial reign, for a thousand years, one fine day. And the reality is that you and I are going to live with God forever. That's the reality. The reality is, God is the, uh, you have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. That's reality. Lies of Satan's cosmic system are all around us in the media with ungodly people and they're always telling us things that contradict what God's word says. This is the same, this is the same attack that took place in the Garden of Eden. They, the, uh, Satan attacked the woman, uh, attacked the woman by attacking God's word. Did his word say that? Did his word say that? And then, con no, you won't die. Contradict God's word. That's the devil's world that you and I live in. So if we want to experience being set apart to go serve God exclusively, to do his will, to experience our sanctification, it's got to be by truth, the word of God. That's why we emphasize the truth of the, in the Bible here because everything pivots off that. Our singing, our giving, our serving, whatever we do, fellowship, has got to be based upon truth. If it's not, all those things are just wood, hay, and straw. So exper uh, experiential sanctification is the post-conversion experience of the church-age believer who's in fellowship with God. How, do you, how are you in fellowship with God? You do so by confessing any known sin to the Father when necessary, and this is main, this restoration of fellowship, this fellowship is maintained by obedience to the Father's will, which is revealed by the Spirit through the Word of God. Its sanctification is experienced by the believer who submits to the desires of the Spirit, which constitutes being filled with the Spirit, which is commanded of the Christian in Ephesians 5.18. This obedience also constitutes obeying the command to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in your soul, Colossians 3.16. This obedience enables the Holy Spirit to reproduce the character of Christ in our lives, the, filling, the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22 and 23. Experiential sanctification, though, is only a potential because it's based upon whether we will walk in faith in what his word says and obey it or not. So there's a, it's, it's experiential sanctification. Unlike uh, perfective sanctification or ultimate sanctification, which is a guarantee, there's no guarantee with experiential sanctification because it's based upon our response to what God has done for us as revealed by the Spirit in his word. So experiential sanctification is only a potential since it's contingent upon the church age believer responding to what God has done for him at the moment of his conversion. Therefore, only believers who are obedient to the word of God will experience sanctification in time. And the believer experiences sanctification by obeying the teaching of the word of God, truth, which states that the believer has been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, and which teaching is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now go to Romans 6, 1, please. We, we looked at this chapter, Romans 6, in relation to positional sanctification. Now we're going to look at it as it relates to experiential sanctification, because what Paul does, 
He shows us who we are in Christ, and then he makes the application, what we're supposed to do. It's fa- and, I, and I pray this can really help you, especially when dealing with sin. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Look at verse 1. What did I say? Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you for telling me. I, sometimes I listen to my playbacks and I go, why didn't anybody tell me that say that? I go, Ro-, like, if you notice, sometimes I'll say Romans or Revelation. And I'll, if I'm in Revelation, I might say Romans. I'm listening to the playback and I go, it's like, why didn't anybody say anything and correct me there? And like, you know, like, like a knucklehead. Sometimes I correct myself, but sometimes I don't. Yeah, that's right, too. That's, that's another one, yeah. Not everybody's snoring. Look at, look at Romans 6.1. Well, some people, they, they, they might not say anything because, you know, they might, uh, they might think it's disrespectful or something, you know, and that, that's all right. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you, if, if somebody says, hey, you know, it's, it's, you, it's Romans, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, because I hate when I listen, like I said, when I listen to all these classes after the playback because I'm always like, like to cr- listen to what's being said and, you know, and uh, what I said and critique things. And, and sometimes I, there's stuff I say that it's not in my notes that I, I want to know because I want to remember what I said because... You know, the Spirit has something to say there. And uh, so it just drives me crazy when I say, no, it's, Ro- it's Romans, not Revelation. <laughs> so anyways, so Romans 6.1. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Because Paul, Paul says that because uh, he's anticipating the arguments of those who oppose grace. He's saying that uh, I, you're under grace but not under the law. So basically... He's anticipating his opponents saying, the Judaizers, for instance, who would say to him, oh, so basically you're saying we should live like, you know, we should just live in sin. You know, you say we're under grace, so therefore we can do whatever we want. No, grace is not a license to sin, but a license to love and serve God. That's what he says. May it never be, verse 2. How sh- and he says, he has the re- a reason why with a rhetorical question that demands uh, a negative response. How shall we who die to sin still live in it? We died to sin. That's... That's retroactive positional truth. When Christ died, God says we died. Okay? So how shall we who died to sin still live in it? Basically, he says it's not consistent with who you are in Christ. You die with Christ, so why live in sin when you're dead to that, to the sin nature? Or do you not know? See, it's all based upon knowledge here. Or do you not know that all of us who've been ident- uh, baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his death. Baptized means identified with. Jesus is not water. Baptized means, baptizo there in the Greek, it talks about being identified with somebody. Here it speaks of the identification with Jesus Christ in his death. So if we've ident- the reason why we're dead to sin is because we were identified with Jesus Christ in his death. What do I mean? God says when, you, when Christ died, I consider you to have died with him. Since you've had faith in my son, you're all bound, everybody in the whole, anybody who believes in my son is all bound up in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and session. They're all in him. They were in Adam. Faith has transferred them out of Adam into a place of condemnation, into a place of blessing. Okay? So, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized or identified with Christ Jesus have been identified with him in his death? Therefore, based upon this information, We've been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Newness of life means eternal life, that new life we've received at the moment of our conversion. Walk means your lifestyle, conduct our lives. So he's saying, therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into his death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We got that new life. So God did all this through his son, identified us with his son and his death so that we could walk, be raised with his son and walk in that new life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, in the Greek it says, and we have, it's a reality, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's a guarantee of a resurrection body. The guarantee of perfective sanctification. Sanctification is the guarantee of a resurrection body. Perfective sanctification or ultimate sanctification is the perfection of, our, of, of sanctification is, is through when we get our resurrection body. So if, and we could say, if we, if and let us assume it's true for the sake of argument, we become united with him in the likeness of his death, and the response is, and we have, because they've been taught this, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's the guarantee of a resurrection body. That's perfective sanctification. Knowing this, knowing this is important here. Knowing this that our old self, the old sin nature, 
was crucified with him. Why? In order that our body of sin, that's the location of the sin nature, might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. So basically he's saying, when you sin, when you sin, you're putting yourself back under slavery to the sin nature. Because whoever you obey, whether it's God or the sin nature, you become their slave. So he's saying, you now are in Christ. You've died and raised with Christ. Why go back in, under the tyranny of the old sin nature and sin when you've been freed from it? You've been, you've been released from the prison cell. Why go back into the prison cell? It's basically saying, it's like saying, okay, you've been in prison for 25 years, you know, in a, in a, in a maximum security prison, all right? You released. Why would you want to go back there? Why would you want to go back there? He's saying, look at verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, and the Greek, it's, it, the Greek is like this. The Greek with mine would say, if and we, let's assume that it's true for the sake of argument, we have died with Christ. And the audience would say, it's a response to first class condition. Yes, we know this is true. We believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again, death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once and for who? All, the whole human race. But that the life that he lives, he lives to God. Christ lives to please God the Father. Now verse 11 makes the equates us in this thing. We have to do the same thing. Verse 11, even so. Here's where faith comes in. Maybe this will give you a little insight in what faith is, too. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. How is that exercising faith? Because he just said, we've died with Christ. That's what God says about you and I. That's reality. That's what God's done for you at the moment of your conversion. This is how he views you. Faith says, I consider myself, I agree with God. I consider myself to be dead to the sin nature just like God says I am. That's walking in faith. So when you consider yourself dead to the sin nature, that's walking in faith. Consider, it has to do with our thinking. Think, we want to think God's word. That's what God wants us to do. We can't act and speak the way God wants us to if we don't first think like that. Okay? So he says, even so, verse 11, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. If you do that, you're experiencing your sanctification. There it is. Then he goes on to say, verse 12, therefore, do not let sin, the sin nature, reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Okay, he's saying, don't let it do whatever it wants to do. Say no to it, in the sense, say, by saying yes to God. Uh, you don't allow the sin nature to run rampant in your life when you say yes to God. So God's done something about the sin nature. We don't have to fight the sin nature. We obey him, and the sin nature will, be put, will, be, uh, will remain, uh, not in, will not in control of your life. If you say yes to God, God will be in control of your life. If you say yes to, if yes to God and obey him, the sin nature is not going to run rampant in your life. All right? So he says, he says in verse 12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body, your hands, your arms, your legs, your tongue, your mouth, your eyes. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to the sin nature as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Why? Because that's how God considers you. You're raised with Christ. You're alive. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So we have a choice to make. So I remember, as I said before, experiential sanctification is only potential. It's contingent upon us obeying and having faith in what God says about us, that we die with Christ and we're raised with Christ. Look at verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you were not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Absolutely not. Do you not know? Again, notice knowledge here. Now, wait a minute. Knowledge is not everything. Knowledge is you've got to apply the knowledge. Some people, there are some people in Christianity who poo-poo knowledge of the word of God. That's ridiculous because you're sanctified by truth, Jesus prayed for. Okay? So you can't do it God's will if you don't know his word. 
And there's another group that says knowledge is just about everything and that's it, but they don't apply it. Both groups are wrong. The ones that are right, remember Jesus said, who are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? But those who hear the word of God and do it. So we got to hear it. We got to do it. Knowledge of God's word is what? Power. We experience the power of God in our life when we have when we obey God's word, when we have faith in God's word, which results in obedience to God's word, now God's power is working in our life. If we do what Paul says up to this point, God's power is going to be deal, helping us to deal with that sin nature that we all have. Then he says, in, so he says in verse 16, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of the sin nature resulting in death. And when he says death there, He's not talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death. Do you realize that loss of fellowship with God, not being in fellowship with God, is death? It is. It's miserable. That's why you always do this. If you feel like you're miserable, you're cranky, you know what? Check yourself. Maybe you need to confess your sin. Maybe you're living in your sin nature and confess the sin. And you know what? The more you stay in fellowship with God, as you grow up, you're not going to want to stay miserable and stay in your flesh for very long. Because if you have any sense, you'll say, I don't want to, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be miserable. Then don't. Don't be. We, we're miserable because we choose to live in the sin nature. When we live in the fe fellowship with God, there's joy and peace and, and happiness, even in the midst of adversity. So think about these things. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves or obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death temporal spiritual death, in other words, loss of fellowship with God, or of obedience resulting in righteousness, experiencing God's righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. Notice teaching is so important because they were... But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you, beca you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. In other words, you're not a slave of sin because you've obeyed the teaching of the word of God. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Positionally, experientially, again, that's up to us whether we want to experience being a slave of righteousness. Slave of righteousness means, righteousness means you're a slave to God. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. Basically saying, I'm bringing it down to your level so you can understand because your sin nature is such that you, I have to do it this way. I have to use analogies and everything to get to speak to you about this, to help you understand this. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and the lawless, lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness prior to your conversion, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in what? Sanctification. How do you do that? Look at verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And do not let the sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. How do you do that? Consider yourself dead to the sin nature and alive to God. Then, he's, look what he says in verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you der then deriving from the things of which you were now ashamed? Nothing. Just shame. You're ashamed of that stuff you did before you became a Christian. For the outcome of those things is death. Spiritual death resulting in physical death and resulting in eternal death in the lake of fire. But now, having been freed from sin through the faith in Jesus Christ, the moment of your conversion, and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in what? Sanctification. And the outcome, eternal life. Notice that sanctification, experiencing it, is related to experiencing eternal life. Of course it is. Do you know fellowship is all about experiencing eternal life? They're all related. They're not different from each other. If you're experiencing fellowship with God, you're experiencing eternal life. You're experiencing your sanctification. You're experiencing your salvation, your deliverance from sin and Satan. They're all related. <laughs> They're not in disconnected. They're all interconnected. So then he says, for the wages of sin is death. But the, it actually talks about the sin nature paying out death. But the free gift of God is what? Life, eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the will of the Father is for you and I to obey the Spirit's teaching in the Word of God 
that we've been crucified with Christ, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, which constitutes experiencing sanctification. Um, go to Ro- Ephesians. This time I want you to go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, very quickly. We touched on this last week. I want to show you that you're raised and seated with Christ. Before I go on to my next point, look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 1. And you, Ephesian believers, were dead in your trespasses and sins. So that has to be spiritual death because he's talking about their, their pre-conversion days when they were not a Christian. So the dead there talks about spiritual death. That means you have no relationship and fellowship with God. So that's called, in theology, real spiritual death. We, as Christians, can experience temporal spiritual death, which is different because we already have the life of God, but when we sin, we choose not to live in the life of God. We choose not to have fellowship with God. But we confess the sin and we can obey God and we can experience eternal life. The unbeliever doesn't have that. They have to have faith in Jesus as Savior before they can receive eternal life so they can have and experience fellowship with God. So, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, the unbelievers. So the people who are unbelievers around this, they're dead. You ever go to a place where everybody's an unbeliever and it's like you're walking into a morgue. Nobody knows Jesus. Nobody knows anything. You feel like I'm, I'm the only person who's alive in this room. You ever feel that? Going to a room with people? Absolutely. Now, the first, now you have to make a, you have two choices to make. You can get start being arrogant, say you know all these people, and just you know look down on them and everything. Instead, you should have a heart of compassion and go, these people are dead. They need life, and here I am. Okay, so maybe they might not listen to me. Well, I'm going to pray for these people. I know I can do one thing. I know I can always do for these people that they will they they have no choice over is me praying for them. So we have to look at them as in need, like we were. Thank God somebody prayed for us and gave us the gospel. You know, uh, we should look at these people, not d- look down on at their noses, at, uh, look our noses down at them, but and be arrogant, but say, "Gee, these have compassion for them, just like Jesus did." I mean, he hung around with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, giving them eternal, you know, speaking the gospel to them, and they received received the word of God and received eternal life as a result of having faith in him. If he didn't have compassion for these people, I mean. If he, God doesn't have compassion for us, nobody gets saved. So we have to be like God is. So, verse 3, among them, the unbelievers, we all too formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Look at this. And he raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The devil doesn't want you to know that. You know why? Because where is Christ seated? In a place of victory at the right hand of the Father. If we pray from our position in Christ, if we live from that position, yeah, we're on the earth, but we live in light of the reality that we're at the right hand of the Father, you'll walk around with some spiritual self-esteem, won't you? You're a child of the king. That's who you are. Why should we be timid? Why should we be afraid of anything in life? The worst thing is to be afraid of life. We shouldn't be. We're in a place of victory. But do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because that's what it all comes down to. Your faith and my faith in what this says. We're raised and seated with Christ. I got, a, I got a, an, an email from somebody who read our book on prayer. Keep that in, 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 keep that in prayer I would love to see the books get going, we, but we just don't have the money to do it since we came here to Marion. But keep that in prayer that people, we can get the books going again. There was a person who got, sent me a thing, and the, actually the book on prayer is actually on our website too. I put it on PDF format. But they said, I did a section on prayer on our position in Christ and that when you're in fellowship with God and praying, you're at the right hand of the Father. You're dangerous. So that person said, I never thought a prayer like that. It changed their prayer life. And that, to me, that made my day. I could, run a, I could run for six months on something like that. 
with that little bit of encouragement, that is great. That person got that, that helped somebody. I mean, that's all right. I did something good. God used me for something good. That is tremendous. Now, that person is now a threat to the kingdom of darkness because now that person knows hey, I'm, I know where I am in prayer. I know where I'm, I'm dangerous. The devil does not want you and I to know that because he can't stand against this because he can't stand against Christ. But if we realize and aware of the fact that we are in union with Christ, that we're see, raised and seated with Christ in a place of victory over him in the kingdom of darkness, what can men do to us? We're, in, we're conquerors. We're we're invincible, really. You can kill us, but we still win. You can put us to death. We still win. No one can defeat us. We're on the winning side. So the will of the Father, the will of the Father is for you and I as believers to obey the Spirit's teaching in the Word of God that we've been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, which constitutes experiencing sanctification. I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians now. We're going to look at a couple of passages in 1 and 2 Thessalonians about sanctification, where Paul mentions it. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4.3. 1 Thessalonians 4.3, please. First Thessalonians 4.3. People say... What's the will of God? Oh, it's the will of God. What do you want to talk about? There's a will of God in a lot of areas. The will of God. For this is the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. We always look at this chapter in relation to the rapture because that's what's mentioned in verses 13 through 18. But look at the beginning of the chapter. For this is the will of God. Your sanctification. To, for you to experience being set apart to serve God exclusively. To be his servant. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Remember, we talked about sanctification is experiencing God's holiness. That was the, the introduction last week. Sanctification is related to experiencing God's holiness. Remember, we said in 1, Thessalon- 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16, Peter says, quoting Leviticus, be holy as your f- heavenly Father is holy. That's related to sanctification. So notice Paul says that you abstain from sexual immorality. How do you do that? Didn't we read Paul? Consider yourself dead to the sin nature and alive to God. I remember there was a, there was a story, uh, Chuck, one of Chuck Swindoll's books. And Chuck Swindoll was in this, uh, at some place, and he was, away, he, was, uh, he was traveling, and he was in this hotel. And uh, this beautiful, he gets, in the, he gets in this elevator, and this beautiful girl just walks into the elevator, and she basically comes on to him. And he just says, he remember saying, you know, like she, he said she was gorgeous, you know, and he goes, uh, and he considered himself, he, said, he started thinking of Romans 6, consider myself dead to the sin nature or alive. Don't present the members of your body as instruments of righteousness but unrighteousness. And he, and he, and he, you know, he walked out of the, the elevator, you know, maintaining his, his, his sexual purity and, with his wife. And, but he had a choice. He, he, he shows how he used his position in Christ to deal with that situation of temptation. So, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, the unbelievers. So basically he's saying, use the body God gave you to glorify him, not to sin. Okay? Look at 2 Thessalonians now. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. You know, I, I, I'm amazed. You know, I, I like to go, I'll, I'll, I'll listen, to, I'll go to different places, websites, to see what other pastors are teaching throughout the country. And it's really sad. A lot of these guys, one, one major thing I notice, not many guys are teaching the different books of the Bible. They're not. They're doing, they're doing little, um, you know, t- uh, you know what, what do they call them? Uh, categorical studies, you know, like a, you know, like a subject, like we're doing today. But that's all they do. They don't teach, go through the different books. They don't go through a book like Philemon or very real. Very, the other thing is, they don't teach this. They don't teach positional sanctification. They don't teach about your union and identification with Christ. 
crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. Very few guys are doing that. That's sad. Why? That's one of the heart of Paul's teaching. Pauline teaching was that. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, Thessalonians, brethren, beloved by the Lord. That's you and I. We're beloved by the Lord. We're believers too. Beloved by the Lord. Why? Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, to, to, to be experiencing your deliverance from sin and Satan. That's what salvation means. Through sanctification. How does sanctification accomplish? By the Spirit and faith in the truth. Right back to truth again. Who is the Spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit. He is speaking in the Word of God. He's inspired the Holy Spirit. He's inspired the Word of God, which is truth, which is reality. So we experience our sanctification, our deliverance from sin, by obeying the Spirit, by having faith in what the Spirit says, in the Word of truth. It's all together. God is brilliant. It's so simple, yet we make it so complicated. Now, the believer who experiences sanctification, as we noted in Romans 6, is walking in new life. Newness of life means new life. It speaks of eternal life. And he does this by obeying this teaching of the word of God, which states that the believer has been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, and which teaching is inspired by the Holy Spirit, as we saw in Romans 6. You and I, as believers, can experience this victory and deliverance over sin and Satan by appropriating by faith the teaching of the word of God that were crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. Our faith in the teaching of the word of God that we've been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ will express itself in obedience, which results in us experiencing sanctification. In other words, experiencing the holiness of God in our lives. Experiencing purity. Just like God's pure. The believer who appropriates by faith the teaching of the word of God. Appropriate means takes possession of. The believer who appropriates by faith the teaching of the word of God, that he's been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, will experience deliver deliverance from the sin, the lust patterns of this old sin nature. The believer who considers him, the members of his body to be dead to, the, to these things, these lust patterns of the old sin nature, since they were crucified at the cross and has died with Christ. The believer is to consider the members of his body, as we saw in Romans 6, to be dead to the sin nature and alive to God. If we do that, we'll experience our sanctification. Look at Colossians 3, please. Look at Colossians 3. I usually look at this, this chapter in relation to the first four verses, but if you keep reading, there's an application of the first four verses that he gives us, Paul. Look at Colossians 3. We're going to do this book, too. I, um, I'm debating whether we, after we do, we're going to do 2 John in a couple of weeks. That's only one chapter. That'll take us like a month to do. Then we're going to do probably another brief little study between books. Then we're going to do 3 John, which is the smallest book in the New Testament. Then I'm going to do an Old Testament book, which is a chapter, probably Obadiah or something. When I come back to the New Testament, I'm probably, I might very well go into Colossians after that. So, but Because uh, Colossians is really is a great book too, so they're all great, right? <laughs> I say, oh, this is a great book, this is a great book, that's a great book, yeah. I mean, everything's a great book. It's in the Bible, Bill, you know? So if have a little uh, mercy when I always say, oh, it's a great book, after every book, you know? Oh, Obadiah, it's a great book. Does he, oh, every book is a great book for this guy. Yeah, I guess so. I listen to myself one day, and I'm going, geez, you know, it's kind of funny watching yourself. I said, right, guys, <laughs> every book is great with you. Look at, look at Colossians 3.1. Therefore, here's our position in Christ. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, the Greek says, if, and let us assume that it's true for the sake of argument, we've been raised up with Christ. And in response to first class condition, the audience would say, of course we are. How do we know that? Because that's what he teaches. Keep seeking. Based upon this, he's saying, because we're raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, your position in Christ, seated at the right hand of God. Just what we read in Ephesians. Set your mind. That means concentrate. Anybody who tells you the spiritual life is not difficult is full of baloney. It's a war. Because my sin nature is saying, no, don't concentrate on your position in Christ. The devil is saying, no. And the distractions of the world, no. It takes concentration. It's hard to concentrate. I right know, I know fully well, when you guys sit here and hear the word of God, 
it's hard sometimes to concentrate, but you gotta, you gotta put, you gotta ask God to help you and his power, you can do it. You can do anything with God's power. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. I know that, but it's tough, isn't it? Sometimes it's sometimes very tough for me to concentrate when I'm teaching sometimes. It, it, you have to concentrate on God, on what he has to say, on what the word of God has to say about you and I. Set your minds on the things above. Your position in Christ. See it at the right hand of the Father, right? Not on the things that are on the earth. Does that mean you should not pay attention to things of the earth? Well, I'm setting my mind on the things above, therefore I'm neglecting my wa- taking care of my wife and kids. Now that's, Paul would say, you're an idiot. He would. He would say you're an idiot. He said, obviously that doesn't mean that. But he's saying, what does he mean? He's saying, this should be number one priority. Okay? This is going to help you take care of your wife and your children. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For, why? For you've died. With who? Christ. And your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ who is our life is revealed at the rapture, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Resurrection body. Now don't miss this. Therefore, verse 5, therefore says, based upon what I just said to you in the first four verses, consider the members of your bo- earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. All those things are idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. Sound like Ephesians? Yeah. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. If every Christian did this today, you'd never have a church split. We'd never have the church split. We had a prayer of people did this. We'd never have it. It never would happen. Never would come close to happen. So what does that tell you? We have these things because people disobey God. Do not lie to one another. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed by a true knowledge and experiential knowledge according to the image of one who, cre- who created him. A renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is, in, is all and in all. So, there it is. Your position in Christ is the basis for you to experience your sanctification. Your positional sanctification, crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. That's how God views me. That's that's the reality. That's who I am. Now you want to experience that which is true of you positionally. You got to do what he says. Apply. I'm not going to use my eyes to look at pornography because that, I'm going to consider my eyes dead to those things because why? I've died with Christ and I'm raised with Christ. All right? So, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified so you and I might not live for the lusts of our old sin nature, but for the will of God. That's 1 Peter 4, 1 through 3. Prior to our conversion, you and I were enslaved to the lust patterns of the old Adamic sin nature. And since we, uh, we were under real spiritual death, meaning that we had no capacity to have a relationship and fellowship with God or start one with God. However, at the moment of our conversion, when we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior... The baptism of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's omnipotence, freed you and I from the sin nature. He did this by identifying us with Christ in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session, as we saw in Romans 6, 4 through 7, and Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. So when you have an opportunity, a temptation, a sin, we've got to, we have to be, we have to learn to think, be disciplined in our thinking. God help me, you got to say, God help me through the Spirit to think these things when I come to a temptation and sin. That's what we have to do. The more we practice it, dealing with sin by, by using God's word, the better we'll get at it. We're not going to be good at it when we first start doing it. Don't think you're going to be like Paul. No, it takes practice. Paul took practice for Paul. And so the more you do anything, the more you apply God's word to dealing with sin, the better we'll be at it. But if we never try to do anything about it, and we never pr- apply it, or we never try to apply it, or ask God to help us, we're never going to get better at it. That's why the church, many times, we people in the church, they lose their joy. They, lose, they have no power. They have no testimony. They look no different than the rest of the world. Why? Because they don't either, A, don't know these things, or B, they don't care to know these things, or C, they know these things, but they don't care to apply them. Okay? So, this identification with Christ and his death and resurrection 
in session at the right hand of the Father, sets up the potential for you and I to experience our deliverance from sin, the sin nature. And it provides us the guarantee of experience this deliverance permanently in the resurrection body at the rapture of the church. After you're saved, what happens? God wants you to experience your, his holiness, his sanctification, have fellowship with him. He doesn't want to wait, wait, he doesn't want to wait uh, have you wait for the rapture. You got work to do now. He, the job that he wants us to do is become like his son, Jesus Christ, more and more. And how did he all start that, make that possible? By identifying us through the baptism of the Spirit, the moment of our conversion, identifying us with, us with Christ in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session. Also, at the moment of our conversion, God gave us a new nature that gives us the capacity to experience deliverance from the lust patterns of the old sin nature. 2 Peter 1.4 we have the divine nature. You know why we have the divine nature? Because the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit indwells us. Why do you think Paul says in first, look at 1 Corinthians. Look at what Paul says. We need to do this more often like Paul says to the Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. This is pretty cool. First Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 16. Now the Corinthians, <laughs> the Corinthians, they were a wild crowd. Corinthians, there was a, in the ancient world, a Corinthian girl was it a slang for a person who was very, a girl, woman who was very, like a prostitute, very immoral, promiscuous. The Corinthians were fr from, from a place where, you know, like any other people of a big city, a lot of loose living, promiscuous, I mean, they went and the they had sex with temple prostitutes as part of their pagan worship. They did that. Male prostitutes, female prostitutes. It, it, was, the, it was a mess that they came from. And Paul had his hands full with these people. And he battled with them. Look what he says to them. And this, this uh, battle with sin that they had. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know? Boy, Paul likes to talk about knowing something, doesn't he? When he says this, he's saying, you do know it. I taught you this. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? Why? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit dwells you. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Why does he just mention the Spirit, not the Father and the Son? Because the Spirit is the one whose job it is to conform us into the image of Christ. It for us, helps us to experience sanctification. And he does that through the teaching of the Word of God. That's why he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Was it 1 Thessalonians 5.19? Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. And Acts talks about that. Because when, when we say no to God and we sin, we're grieving the Holy Spirit because he's the one who's speaking to us about the Father's will. Okay? So he says in verse 16, do you not know that you're a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? And they would say, yeah, we know that. Then what, then what are you doing, guys? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Basically saying, why are you living in a manner that's not true of you? Why, why are you living in a manner consistent what you were prior to your conversion? Dead in sins and transgressions. Dead in Adam. Can, uh, deceived by the devil. You're, you're, the, God dwells you. Why would you want to present the members of your body and get involved in these gross forms of immorality, which you were involved in habitually prior to getting, becoming Christians, why would you want to do that now? Why would you want to live like a bum now when you're a child of a king? Now look at, look at 1 Corinthians 6. Look at verse 18. Actually, look at verse 12. First Corinthians six twelve. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through His power. That's perfective sanctification when we're perfected. Do you not know? <laughs> that your bodies are members of Christ. 
Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Absolutely never, may it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? Let me tell you something. Um, pornography, you might, not have, if you, you might not be having a, a, a physical contact with a prostitute. But in your heart, you've committed idolatry and adultery and sexual immorality with a, with a woman or the man, whoever you're watching with the pornography for. That's what you've done. You can deceive yourself into thinking you haven't done it, but you have. So that's, just, that's like joining yourself with a harlot, a prostitute. So he says, or do you not know, verse 16, that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh, but the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So, we see here that the believer sins because he chooses to disobey the teaching of the word of God that his sin nature was crucified with Christ at the cross and thus allows the sin nature to control and influence his soul so that he produces mental, verbal, and overt acts of sin. Our sin nature will not be totally eradicated until we physically die or when the rapture takes place. That's when we receive our resurrection body to replace the body we now have and which contains the sin nature. In the meantime, the believer, you and I, have a battle raging within us since we have two natures which are diametrically opposed to one another. The divine nature, the indwelling of the Trinity, and the sin nature. So we have a war raging within us we have two, because we have two natures which are diametrically opposed, opposed to one another and we must choose between the two since the old sin nature wars against the spirit. Galatians 5.17 teaches that. So as we close, appropriating by faith our position in Christ constitutes walking by means of the Spirit since the Spirit teaches in the Word of God that the Christian has been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. The believer loses fellowship through obeying the sin nature and committing personal sins. However, he's restored through the confession of sin. That's why this thing that came out, this teaching, that me and Jim Ricard, we confronted, uh, we want to go out and we wanted to confront this because uh, it, yeah, one thing we want to help our brothers in, who, in Christ who are teaching this false doctrine that you don't have to confess your sin as a believer, but we're also trying to protect our own people, some of which listen to these guys. So uh, we have to do, this is, this is why we made such a big deal about it, because if you don't think you have to confess your sin, you're going to be putting yourself under discipline and you have no fellowship with God because of the sin, that's a bad thing. It destroys the spiritual life of the church. I will fight, and I know Jim will, I will fight with you. I will fight with you against that. That is wrong. We're to confess our sins because of fellowship. God's holy. How can God, how can we live in our, our flesh, our sin nature, and, have fel and, and, that, and not confess it, and have, think we're going to have fellowship with God when we don't have to confess it? you got to be kidding me. So this fellowship with God is maintained by bringing our thoughts into obedience to the teaching of the Spirit, which constitutes obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be influenced by the Spirit. So we read a couple things, many things today. The Holy Spirit sp spoke through Paul saying different things to believers, like that passage about the indwelling of the Spirit. We're, that's the Spirit talking to us. We, we need to listen to what God's saying. That's why I say at the beginning, it isn't Bill. It'd be Bill if I was reading from, you know, 1 Bill chapter 5, verse 1. Thou shalt, Charyan and Tyler should, shall go and get uh, iced tea for Pastor Bill. I mean, I can make it. I mean, no, it's, it's the Bible. It's not Bill. And if I de deviate, listen to me, if I deviate from what the scripture says or misinterpret it, that ain't, that ain't the God. That's Bill. So, we have to understand that God is speaking to us through the word of God and we need to respond in faith. Obeying the Spirit's teaching in the word of God, which constitutes being filled with the Spirit, is also synonymous with the command of Colossians 3.16 to let the word of Christ richly dwell in our souls since both produce the same results 
and the Spirit inspired the Scriptures. Therefore, obedience to the Word of God will enable the believer to experience fellowship with God, which is synonymous with, this, with exper uh, experiencing sanctification. Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time to study your Word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would do a mighty work through all of us here this morning and help us to appropriate by faith what your, your, the Holy Spirit says to us regarding your will in the Word of God, the mind and thinking of Christ. We pray, Father, that this class would have brought glory to you and ministered to your people. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, we're going to uh, take up our Sunday morning offering. And uh, the song I want to do is going to be, uh, let me see. Lord, I need you. So if anybody finds that page, yeah, page 100. Page 100, Lord, I need you. Don't we all need them? All right, uh, let's, let's pray for this offering. Father, we thank you for this time to partake in giving to you, Father, and the body of Christ and to su support the propagation of the teaching of the Word of God in this ministry. We thank you for those who are here this morning. They're going to take part in the giving and any others who are listening to us on the Internet that you move to give. We just pray, Father, that uh, uh, they be blessed by the giving because your son taught it's more blessed to give than to receive. We were also pray that this offering would produce many thanksgiving to you father and meet our needs and you know what those needs are so we just pray father that this offering and whatever comes in this week will uh, help us to uh, keep going here we thank you father for uh, another another day of bible doctrine so we pray father for this offering in our lord and savior jesus christ's name amen all right uh, page 100 we're going to do lord i need you I tell you something, before I, this morning, when I woke up this morning, I tell you, I, I had, uh, I went to bed early at nine, got up, and then uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, 1.30 as usual, and then uh, I couldn't fall back asleep, so I fall back asleep around 3.30 in the morning, storm wakes me, uh, an alarm clock wakes me up, I just had, I just didn't feel great, and then, you know, spiritually, and it was like, you know, but I feel great now, <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is, what, what, what it doesn't, what's so funny is like, the Word of God, even when I'm in a bad mood, even when I'm, I don't feel good physically, the Word of God does, whether it's, what, af, yeah, after I, after, whether it's studying it or teaching it, it always makes me feel better. What's that? Yeah. Okay, see if I can do this. moment without your spirit I am flesh can I do a thing without you but with your power I can't do oh, oh your will Lord with you I know I can move the mountains and walk upon the raging seas of my life Lord with you I know I'm marching on a victory but I've got to keep my eyes on you Lord I do need Lord I do need Lord I do need you When I was a baby Christian I 
tried to do things on my own Soon I learned a simple lesson But I'm so very weak and you're so strong Lord with you I know I can move the mountains and walk upon the raging seas of my life Lord, with you I know, marching on to victory But I've got to keep my eyes on you Lord, I do need Lord, I do need Lord, I do need you Every moment of every minute Of every hour of every day Every moment of every minute of every hour of every day Every moment of every minute of every hour of every day Every moment of every minute of every hour of every day Yeah Lord I do need Lord I do need Lord I do need you Wanna hear my blessed Savior Say those words that matter most Well done, good and faithful servant And with his strength I know that I will hear those words Lord, with you I know I can move the mountains Walk upon the raging seas of my life Lord, with you I know I'm marching on a victory But I've got to keep my eyes on you Lord, I do need Lord, I do need Lord, I do need you Lord, I do need you Lord, I do need you, yeah Lord, I do need Lord, I do need Lord, I do need you You're dismissed. Thank you.